Thank you for leading that second verse. I love that line. Yet in my dreams I'd be nearer my God to thee. That almost, when it does, it actually got me a little emotional. That's a beautiful song. So I hope you sing it like you mean it. Are you happy to be here this morning? Good morning to you. Are you happy that you're a child of God? Are you happy you're a Christian? What a blessing it is to be near to the Lord. What a blessing it is to be children of God. We get to live. We are privileged to live. We are blessed with the gift of living the best life from here to eternity. That's been our theme this year. We've kind of touched on it here, a little bit here, and a little bit there. This morning, I want to explore that theme with you by considering just how sweet it is to be a child of God, just how wonderful it is to be a Christian. That's it. That's the whole point. That's all I'm going to talk to you about. Nothing too deep, nothing too intellectually stimulating necessarily. It's just a quick little pick-me-up, a little jolt, uh, a little kick in the pants to remind us that we really do have it good, that we have the best life available to us. This world around us might be miserable. This world around us might be doing everything it can, whether intentionally or otherwise, to make us miserable. But regardless of that, we are near to the Lord. Regardless of that, we are Christians. Regardless of all of that is around us that could make us bad, that could make us feel bad, we get to live the best life that there is, and I would not trade it for anything else the world could offer me. Even if they, even if they offer me no more hardship, and no more persecution, and no more difficult times, and they offer me all the money in the world, and all the riches, and the, and the silver, and the gold, and all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of it, I would not, I would not take that deal. This world is passing away. God is forever. I will be near to Him. I will be living with Him forevermore. To explore that idea with you, to explore with you how sweet it is to be children of God, I want you to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 60. So, in other words, to talk about how sweet it is, we're going to consider a text that talks about how sweet it's going to be. That's Isaiah's perspective. He's looking at it in the future tense. He's promising and predicting and prophesying of a day that is yet to come from his perspective. He's looking at it as, I'm preaching to this people, Judah, my people, the nation of God the last vestiges of faithfulness that there is in the old Israel. The northern kingdom has been decimated and laid waste by Assyria, and now Babylon is coming for us. We're all that's left, and there's not much of us that's left at all either, of just us. Not, much, not many of us are faithful. We're going to be decimated. We're going to be leveled. We're going to be taken out by Babylon. But the day is coming, Isaiah says, when the Messiah will arrive. The promise has been made, and God is going to keep that promise, that one day his Savior for us will be born, and he will usher in a new, glorious, golden era of peace and prosperity and righteousness. And Isaiah writes all throughout his book, but here in chapter 60, it's going to be our focus this morning. He says, look at how great it's going to be when the Messiah gets here. We are going to study Isaiah 60. We are going to read Isaiah say, look how great it's going to be, and we're going to take that and turn that around and say, look how great we have it, because we, as Christians, as members of that messianic kingdom, as citizens of that spiritual city of God that Isaiah had only been promising, we get it in reality, so we get to look at those promises and remind ourselves, yeah, yeah, we do have it pretty good. It really is great to be children of God. Let's consider that by looking at the text. Let's start with the first four verses. How sweet it is you get to be saved. How sweet it is, let me put the emphasis on the right part there, how sweet it is you get to be saved. Forget salvation as a general concept. That was coming for somebody. It gets to be you. You get to be that somebody. God's bringing down salvation and he's not leaving you out. How sweet is that? Look at the text, the first four verses, Isaiah 60. Rise and shine, Isaiah says. Rise and shine, your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth. Gross darkness will cover the people. But the Lord shall arise upon you, and his glory shall be seen upon you. And the Gentiles shall come into your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. So lift up your eyes round about and see. All that gather themselves together, they're coming to you. The son shall come from afar. The daughter shall be nursed at your side. There's obviously more. We're going to look at the whole chapter here. And just in, throughout the sermon, but just those first four verses setting the tone, rise and shine. Why do you rise and shine? Because you've been asleep. You've been in the darkness of the night. 
proverbially Judah is about to go into some dark times. They're about to enter into a dark period where they're going to be in, in captivity under Babylon's rule and then Persia after them. They're going to have this darkness. They're going to have this, this bleakness. They're going to have this despondency about them. They're going to feel like God has forgotten about us. We're all alone. We're lost in the darkness. We're adrift at sea. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what we're going to do. And Isaiah says, darkness will pass. The night will end and then the sun will rise. The sun, S-U-N, your S-U-N will rise. God's S-O-N will descend, but that's just word, words for you. The sun's going to rise. Rise and shine, the sun is coming. The darkness is ending. That's the messianic reign of Jesus. That's the promise of a spiritual new beginning. The promise of a new day is about to dawn. You've got the darkness of evil all around you, but don't worry. Darkness doesn't last, but just for the night. And then comes the morning. And when the morning breaks, you will get to bask in that light. I'm not pointing at you. I'm pointing to the Gentiles, or more to the Jews rather, because that's who Isaiah is writing to. He's writing to his fellow Israelites, his fellow Judeans. He says, you will have your Messiah, your long-expected Savior, your one that was promised from Abraham. And you could even go further back, but from their perspective, that promise made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that through their seed would come our Deliverer, your Deliverer. Isaiah says, it's almost here. He's just on the other side of this one night you've got to get through. This one proverbial period of darkness, and then the sun will rise. Rise and shine, here he comes. You get to bask in his light. Raise your hand if you're a Jew. Anybody here? Nope. Everyone here belongs to the American nation, right? Not a one of us belong to the Israelite nation, literally speaking. You can go metaphorical and proverbial and spiritual in Galatians 3 and all that, but we're just talking literal. Not a one of us here are of the Israelite nation. We didn't shoot fireworks a few days ago to celebrate independence from, from uh, um, Antiochus Epiphanes or something like they do you know, every, every Hanukkah or something. That's not what we do. That's not our celebration. We celebrated our national American independence. We're Americans. We say that with pride. We shouldn't have pride, but we say that with pride. We're Americans. We're better than everybody else. Look at all that we have. Look at all these blessings, look at all these privileges that we have because we're Americans. I appreciate when we say the blessings and privileges we have that God has given us. He's given them to other nations too, by the way, but that's not the point of the sermon. Not the point of the sermon. The point is we are of the American nation. We're not of the Israelite nation. So literally, Isaiah isn't talking to us. He's talking to his fellow Jews, his fellow national Israelites. And he says, you have been waiting for your national savior. You have been waiting for your national champion. You've been waiting for your national hero who will descend from your national ancestor, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he doesn't stop there. He says, you, Israelites, will enjoy the light of that Messiah, your savior. But the Gentiles will bask in that light too. In fact, he doesn't say that light. He doesn't say his light. He says they'll bask in your light. He writes to his people. We get to bask in the light of the Jewish Messiah. He gets to take us and invite us into what used to be an exclusive little fold of God had his own little nation carved out in, in the, uh, the you know, western edge of the Fertile Crescent, that his own little, little segment of, of the world that he made his nation. He said, I'll be the God over this tiny little insignificant speck of a people, and I'll be their God, and through them... Through this tiny little people, I'll do wondrous things so that they won't get the glory, I will. And from that tiny little insignificant nation, I will produce this glorious Savior of the whole world. I mean, we've been referencing this promise to, Isaac, to, uh, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What is that promise? Abraham, I'm going to bless whoever blesses you, and I'm going to curse whoever curses you. And in you, through your seed that is to come, Jesus the Messiah, all the families of the earth will be blessed. All the nations of the earth will be blessed. That's us. The American nation is one of those nations of the earth. So if we, as part of the American nation, if we individually make the decision to obey the gospel, we get to become part of a spiritual kingdom, a spiritual era of the Messiah, in which we Gentiles get to bask in the light of the Messiah that was never supposed to be exclusively to the Israelites. It was always supposed to spread outward across the world. But we get to be saved we get to be saved we take that for granted think that to yourself salvation did not stop with the borders of israel salvation did not end with just the hebrew speaking people salvation did not begin and end with the descendants the blood relatives of abraham isaac and jacob we get to be saved how sweet is that we don't have to wait for our own messiah we don't wait for our own savior we don't pray to our own god there is one god who sent one savior and he didn't forget about us how sweet is that 
How sweet is this? You get to worship. Being saved, you get to worship. Let me put the emphasis on the right word there. You get to worship. It's not you have to, though you do. It's not you must, though you must. It's not, I guess, if I get nothing else to do, if, if it's my golf is rained out or whatever else is going on is canceled, if I got nothing better to do. No, 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 no. no this is not the bottom of your, your itinerary. This is the top of the list. This is the most important thing that you can do is living this Christian life. And in that Christian life, what you do primarily, what you do first, because it comes on the first day of the week, is you worship, but you get to worship. Listen to verses 5 through 9, Isaiah 60. Just continuing from where we left off. Then you shall see and flow together, and your heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto you. The sea is metaphor for all the nations of the world, but that's just poetic writing. Anyway, it'll all be converted unto you. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto you. The multitude of camels shall come cover you, and the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all from Sheba, shall come. They'll bring gold and incense, and, you'll, and they will know the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto you. The rams of Nebaioth shall minister unto you. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. Who are these that fly as a cloud, and as the doves to their windows? Surely the isles shall wait for me. And the ships of Tarshish first to, the, to bring thy sons from afar and their silver and their gold with them unto the name of the Lord your God to the Holy One of Israel because he has glorified you. How has he glorified them? Through their Messiah. That's the point. The Messiah has come and he's come initially he's come for you as Jesus says the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost but he also came first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So he's coming for you. He's coming to save you. You the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's coming for you to be your Messiah. But the light of that Messiah will spread over the world so that all Gentiles who want to enjoy it can enjoy it too. And that's kind of the picture that is painted. Without going into too much of the details of the, the, um, the particulars of Isaiah 60, he writes a lot of what he writes here, and we'll see it especially in the next chunk of text, a lot of conquest metaphorical imagery, a lot of victory imagery like of a warfare. You conquer an enemy, and then they bring you tribute, and they bring you basically taxes they'll start paying to you as their conqueror, as Israel or Judah is about to start having to do to Babylon and so forth. That you'll, you'll start paying them uh, as, as, as your now o overseer. Well, he's saying here in that metaphorical imagery, the Gentiles are all going to come to you, and they're going to start paying tithes, and they're going to start bringing you silver and bringing you gold and paying you tribute because you're going to be victorious over them. But that's just a metaphorical way of painting a picture of here you are, Judah. You're about to be put into subjection under Babylon. But one day, the Babylons of the world will be in subjection to your Messiah, your Messiah, your Savior who's coming to save you, your King, the King of Israel, the King of Kings, your King is going to put everyone in subjection under Him. But what that means is, you're going to be in subjection under Him. I'm going to be in subjection under Him. We're all going to be in subjection under Him. We're all going to be equally His servants. We're all going to come together under Him. And what are we going to do? What are we actually going to do? They're bringing silver. They're bringing gold. They're bringing tributes. But what are they doing? Where are they bringing it? To His altar. We are bringing worship to him. He is coming to conquer us so that we might worship him. God doesn't want your actual silver. God doesn't need your actual gold. What God wants is a heart that is willing to give itself to him. What God wants is all of you. He doesn't want your fat stacks because he's got a bigger bank account than you do. What God wants is the you that has all of that money. What God wants is the you that has all the stuff in the world. God wants you. Everything else is just gravy. What God wants is a person willing to bow down, fall prostrate before him, and worship him. You get to do that. It is so important to God that you worship him. It is so relevant and, and necessary and critical to the relationship that you are going to have with him in Christ, that you worship him, that Jesus died and shed his blood so that you could worship him. Oh, no, no, Jesus died so that I could be saved. Yeah, what do you think he saved you for? Jesus died to shed his blood to wash you clean so that you being clean could approach him and his presence cleaned, cleansed, so that you could have the right to approach his presence and then fall down and worship him. That's what he saved you for. He cleansed you so that you could get back to the relationship you had before you got yourself all dirty when you sinned. And you couldn't clean yourself. And the only way you could be clean is by his blood. And he says, since you can't clean yourself, and so it, since it is so important that you be clean, 
so that you can come to me and worship me. I'm going to send my son to die for you, to shed his blood to cleanse you, so that you can come worship me. It has always been God's prerogative to have his people come worship him. God sent Moses to Pharaoh. Let my people go. That's the quote. We know that part very well. But why let them go? It's not just for nothing. Let my people go so they can come to the mountain and worship me. God has always been all about you coming up to the mountaintop to worship him. You get to do that. It's not a have to thing. It's not a if you must. It's not if I got nothing better to do. You get the privilege of worshiping God. Now listen, here's where we go too far in the other direction. So much today is made about what you're getting out of worship. In, in so many places, so many so-called church houses and places, the emphasis is on what am I getting out of worship? If I'm not feeling something, if I'm not having a good reason to s- close my eyes and sway like I'm at a K-pop concert, then I'm not getting something out of worship, then the worship must have been bad. No, you were bad. You had a wrong heart. You had a wrong attitude. You thought we were worshiping you. What were you getting out of it? That's not the approach. That's not worship. And I think, based on this audience that I know you, you get that. That you're not coming here expecting to get something out of it. But let's not swing that pendulum so far the other way that we run right past Jerusalem and we start teaching the opposite wrong. And we start saying, you should feel bad if you ever feel good in worship. Because I get a lot of that too. I listen to my brethren preach the opposite of that. And they say, it's not about how you feel. It's not about what you get out of it. You have nothing to do with it. It's not about you at all. You should feel bad if you feel good at worship. No, no. Right in the middle is where it should be. You should feel great when you worship. Because you have brought a gift to the Lord. You should feel great because you've been given that privilege and that honor to do so. You should feel good. It's not about you feeling good. That's just a wonderful byproduct of a heart that is desiring to serve the Lord. You should feel great that you have the honor and the privilege of approaching him. That he cleansed your hands and he cleansed your feet. That you could stand on holy ground and fall prostrate before him. That he cleansed your voice so that you could sing praises to him that he cleansed your heart so that you could bring your petitions before him, that he cleansed your mind so that you could study his word and learn more about him and draw closer to him. He made that possible for you. Worship is a gift. Worship is a gift you give to God. Salvation is the gift he gave to you. The gift you give to God is your worship back to him. This is a privilege and an honor. How sweet is that? We get to worship the Lord. How sweet is it? You get to live with him. You get to live with God. God is not over there and you're over here anymore. Sinai, Israelites went to where God was on the mountain. God just put himself on that mountain for that purpose, but that's the idea. They go to the mountain where God is. Mount Zion, the temple, the most holy place, the Ark of the Covenant, presence of God dwelling there, they go up to the mountain to where God is. And then when they're done, when they've offered their worship, then they go down the mountain and they go back to their home. Three, four, five, fifty, a hundred miles away. They go away from where God is. Air quotes, air quotes. But it's not like that anymore. Now you live in the era of the Messiah. Now you live in the home of the Messiah. You call God your father. And if God is your father and you are his children, you're a family. And families live under one roof. You're not his adults. You're his babes. You're his babies. He's taking care of you. You're his little children. You live with him. Let's read the text. Isaiah 60, 10 through 14. Sons of strangers shall build up your walls. Their kings will minister unto you. For in my wrath I smote you, but in my favor I had mercy on you. Therefore your gates shall be opened continually, and they will not be shut day or night. So the men may bring unto you the forces of the Gentiles, so that their kings may be brought. For the nation and the kingdom that will not serve you will perish. Those nations shall be utterly wasted. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto you, the fir tree, pine tree, box tree, to beautify the place of my sanctuary. And I will make the, pl- the place of my feet glorious. Sons also of them that afflicted you shall come bending unto you. And they that despised you will bow themselves down at the soles of your feet. And they will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel. As I said a second ago, conquest imagery. That's, that's a, the only way that he could get the people at the time to understand how good it's going to be. We're this beaten down people. Our entire northern brethren have been decimated. We're about to be decimated. We're going to be put in subjugation under Babylon. We're going to be the the, the stepped on. And then he says, one day, 
the Messiah will come and he will make all things right. He will set everything new. He will make everything better. He will put you in a new place, in a spiritual home where all those people who beat you up will come to you. And they will be conquered by you. Why by them? Because they're the people of the Messiah. So they're in that fight. But they don't know what the fight is. They, they think it's literal and physical, which is why they rejected Jesus when he came. Because they thought he'd be cutting off heads. And it's not, a, it's not a physical kingdom. It's a spiritual one. It's a spiritual fight written about in physical imagery. But that kind of conquest is a spiritual conquest. But the point is, you're going to all come together in this one place. Jerusalem, in the time of Isaiah, is about to be sacked. It's about to be uh, ramrodded. The walls are about to be knocked down. The temple's about to burn. Their gates are going to be destroyed. They're going to look at their walls, and they're going to see their walls breached. And they're going to say, our walls have failed us. We're going to lose, conquered, because our walls couldn't hold up. They're going to look at their gates, in which people come and go. They're, they're going to bar to prevent the Babylonians from getting in. And they're going to watch those gates crumble and break under the pressure of the Babylonian army. And they're going to see their broken gates, and they're going to weep. Because they know all is lost. And Isaiah says, that's going to happen. I'm going to spank you because you were bad. And then I'm going to have mercy on you. And I'm going to put you in a new city. A messianic city. A holy city. And you're going to look at your walls. And you're going to say, salvation. Because they cannot be breached by the devil. You're going to look at your gates. And you're going to think, we really should lock those so the enemy doesn't get in. Oh, no, no, those gates open. We're going to keep those gates open. And we're going to call those gates praise. And we're going to sing out our praise from inside the city out. So that everyone who was out there in the darkness, we'll get to the light in just a second, who was out there in the darkness, our enemies outside the city will hear our praise and will be drawn to it and will come into that city and will dwell with us and will have fellowship with us and will bask in the light of the Savior with us. We're going to open those gates. We're going to call them praise. We're going to look at our walls that protect us. We're going to call that salvation. How sweet is that? We're living in the city of God. How sweet is this? We're living in the city with God. God is there with us. God is the reason those gates are praised. God is the reason those walls are salvation. He has provided this for us. He's right there in the midst of us. How sweet is this? You get to be better than ever. By virtue of your coming into this city to live and to dwell with God, He's making you better than ever. Let's read 15 through 18. Whereas you have been forsaken and hated, so that no one went through you, no one wanted to pass through your land. That's a destroyed, wrecked, ruined, haunted place. But I will make you an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. How many generations? It's a metaphor. He just told you an eternal excellency. You shall also drink the milk of the Gentiles and the breasts of kings. You will know that I am the Lord, your Savior, and your Redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. You'll bring me brass, and I'll turn it into gold. You'll bring me iron, I'll turn it into silver. You'll bring me wood, I'll turn it into brass. You'll bring me stones, I'll turn it into iron. Whatever you give me, I'll improve. Whatever you offer me, I'll make better. You bring me your broken down, beaten up, sin-stricken life. I'll wash it clean. I'll make it new. And I'll make it a servant of my own. I will make your officers peace people, peace bringers, not warriors. I'll make your, my Bible says, exactors, literally your taskmasters. Righteousness. What's a taskmaster? In our mind, we're thinking of that's the guy with the whip, like the, like the Egyptians to, to the Israelites. That's the guy who, who whips them. But why are they whipping them? It's not just for punishment. You whip them to get them to do what you want them to do. Okay, I'm going to make such a better life for you that your taskmaster, the guy who is there to make you do what you're supposed to do, what's he going to be compelling me to do? Not with a whip, but with kindness and words. He's going to make you do righteousness. He's going to be compelled by righteousness to compel others to do righteousness. That's Christian fellowship. That's the positive peer pressure that the Prince of Peace proposes. Violence shall be no more heard in your land neither wasting nor destruction within your borders. Think about how relevant that is to a people about to be under siege. A couple hundred years away, 100 years away from being under siege. No more wasting. No, your city will not be laid waste. No more destruction. Your, this temple is not going to be burned down. None of that will happen within the borders of this spiritual kingdom. But instead you'll call it... There's the walls of salvation and praise. You guys thought I was crazy when I was reading that. That's my bad. I wasn't even reading my Bible. You should read your Bible. Here's the reference. You'll call your walls salvation, your gates praise. Y'all didn't even say, hey, what are you doing? You didn't say anything. You just trusted me that I knew what I was doing, and I didn't. Anyway, the previous text was the city of God, the Zion of the Holy One. That's verse 
14. That's my bad. The city of God, that's because we live with God. That's the point I made. Here, here it is. The wall is called salvation. The gate's called praise. There it is. There's the reference. You have this beautiful big city that you get to live in, and the thing that surrounds you is salvation. And the gates that are in front of you are praise. Everything I just said before, I apply it to right there, because that's what I meant to say. That's my bad, you. The point is, you get to be better than ever. That's the previous highlighted part. You have this horrible life of being beaten down and being persecuted. He's talking to Judah. But for me, I make application to myself. I have, I have this horrible life of being beaten down and persecuted and, and uh, harmed by the devil and by this evil world that the devil has helped to create in his image. But then here comes this little bitty light that I get to be attracted to. Here comes this new city set apart from everything else in the world. This city that is set on a hill and blazes with light that cannot be hidden. I can see it and I can be attracted to it. And Jesus says there in the reference to the Sermon on the Mount, you are that city. You are my people. You get to shine that light. You get to attract those people to come into the gates and to dwell in this city. Well, the only way you're going from there to here, from the darkness to the light, is if you were transformed from darkness to light. So you bring me whatever you want to bring me. All I've got to bring you is stones. I'll turn it into iron. I can bring you brass. I'll turn it into silver. I can bring you silver. I'll turn it into gold. Whatever you do, when you bring it to God, he'll give you the upgrade, is the point. He'll make you better. He'll make you new. He'll make you fresh. He'll make you clean. He'll make you saved. How sweet is that? You get to come to God. You repent, obviously. You repent of what you were, but you come to God just as you are, a broken down, sinful, stricken man with a desire to be better, and then he makes you better. He washes you in his blood and brings you in to his fold. Last one. Look at 19 through 22. How sweet is this? You get to live forever. Verse 19, The sun shall be no more your light by day, neither for brightness will the moon give light unto you, but the Lord shall be unto you an everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. The sun shall no more go down, neither shall your moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be your everlasting light. And the days of your mourning, my Bible says, your sad mourning with a you, your sadness will be ended. Your people also shall be all righteous. They'll inherit the land forever. The branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that it may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, a small one a strong nation. I am the Lord, and I will hasten it in the appropriate time. All this is coming, the prophet says, when God says it's coming. You've got to go through this dark period. You've got to go through this long night, but then the sun will rise. The sun will start to shine. It will be a new morning. But the sun that is going to rise is not going to crest and peak at a hot noonday. It's not going to descend over the western horizon and then disappear till you have another night again. No, no, no. When the sun comes up this time, it's a sun that's going to last. Have you ever gone out in the morning? Not like in the hustle and bustle, I've got to hurry and get to work. But I mean, it's a Saturday you don't have anything to do. You get up really early on a Sunday before worship, and you get up, it's just the morning. I know Frank does it, but for all the rest of you normal people, everybody just get up really early in the morning for no good reason at all, and just look at the morning, and just appreciate the calmness of a new morning. There's just this, this kind of purplish-red streak across the lower part of the sky where the sun is just beginning to rise, and the sky above you, if it's cloudless, is just this beautiful almost smoky kind of deep blue and it just seems to stretch on endlessly and if you live out somewhere where there's not a lot of hustle and bustle you hear the quiet and you hear the morning birds start to sing to wake up the other morning birds and you just take in a deep breath and it's just it's cool it's a little bit dewy and it's just perfect imagine that forever doesn't, it doesn't peak at the sun at, at noon where it gets really hot and it's sweaty and you're busy because you get all this work to do to make your money, to just keep on living. It doesn't descend at the western end of the world and it just, it just goes down and gets dark and then it's long again and it's cold and it's bitter and it's, it's dark and bleak. No, none of that. It's just perpetual, endless mourning. Lamentations 3, the mercies of God are new every, not every noon, not every night, they're new every morning. This beautiful imagery of peace that never ends. That's what is awaiting for Isaiah's audience. That's what he's promising them. You get this long darkness, then the sun will just begin to rise, and it will just hang there. It's not the actual S-U-N sun. It's the S-O-N sun. And his light just shines forevermore. This imagery probably sounds familiar you've read Revelation, this is the tail end of Revelation. This is John's picture of the eternal kingdom. 
he says we get to live forever in this place with God. And how do I describe that, John thinks? Well, I know, I'll just, I'll just pull from Isaiah. As half of Revelation is, it's, it's quotations from the Old Testament, using that as reference point to how glorious and wonderful it is to be citizens of a kingdom that's worth dying for, to be, to be subjects of a king who's worth dying for, that we get to bask in a light of his glory that never goes out. It never gets so hot and uncomfortable. It never fades and diminishes at the evening time. There is no evening time. It's just perpetual morning with God. The light ever shines. There's no moon giving a faint, scant bit of light, just enough to cast some dark shadows and make you, make you scared and wonder what's out there. No, no, no. It's just forever bright, brilliant, beautiful light. You live with God, and you live with God forevermore. How sweet is that? Now, here's my close. You Christians, you're the ones Isaiah was talking about. You're the ones who get to be the recipients of that promise. Those people he was writing to, they're dead and gone. They never saw the kingdom come. That was 700 years later. A kingdom promised by Isaiah, that messianic age promised by Isaiah, has come. That messianic age has begun. 2,000 years ago, it began in Jerusalem, and it spread to the Gentile world. And we, Christians, are the happy recipients of it, living the sweet life of salvation beyond those gates of praise, beyond not these brick walls of the North Heights Church of Christ, beyond the metaphorical spiritual walls of God's kingdom is the world. And if the kingdom of Jesus Christ basks in the light of Jesus Christ out there, is darkness if in here is perpetual eternal darkness uh, or rather eternal light a light which is within the walls of jesus christ and his body then out there is outer darkness and the way you go from out there to in here is you obey the gospel of jesus christ and the way you stay in here and are not told to depart out of here is you live for jesus christ when people are hungry you feed them when they're thirsty you give them drink when they're naked, sick, and in prison, you clothe them, you visit them, you tend to them. You do good to other people in the name of Jesus Christ, living like Jesus Christ would have you to live. And you will hear, come in. This is a place for people who do that, not depart from me. That's for the people who are out there in darkness. Mind you, there are a lot of people out there in darkness, and they need to be invited in to the light. So step out to those gates, stick your head out, and start singing the praise. Start inviting people to come into the light with you. Because we have a sweet life that lasts forever. I want other people to have it too. If you don't have it, if you need it, if you had it and you've walked away from it, the invitation is yours. Become a Christian by believing and being baptized. Live faithful for Jesus Christ. If you haven't been living faithful for Jesus Christ, repent and come back to Jesus Christ. Can we help you? Let us know. Right now as we stand and sing.